Now, we'd like to introduce the uh, next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Andreas Schuster, co-founder and CTO of Orca Energy AG of Europe. We'd like to introduce next speaker, Dr. Schuster. Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, warm welcome from Germany uh, to my presentation. First of all, uh, we will see a short film about uh, Orkan Energy, a short introduction, and later on, I will go into details and explain you uh, a little our way from a spin-off to a global energy player. Hi, we are two Andreases of Orkan Energy, a leading clean tech company here in Europe, based in Munich. And we uh, try to tap uh, the largest so far unused energy uh, source in the world, waste heat. Yeah, we both met uh, at the university in our times where we did research on small scale organic Rankine cycle systems. We showed that those uh, systems can be built small scale, they can be built up very cost efficient and can operate dynamically. And based on these results, we decided as a team to spin off uh, Orkin Energy from the Technical University of Munich. We want to contribute to the global energy revolution uh, and uh, we want to do that by uh, providing clean electricity at the lowest possible cost because at the current system we believe the economic driving force uh, has to be respected otherwise you generate no impact and we want to generate impact we want to help especially emerging markets and uh, process industries to become cleaner now today so we are currently active in three market segments um, power generation marine and industry and in all of them, waste heat is a costly byproduct. So, for example, we try to help ships to become more efficient, more cleaner. We just have installed and commissioned and put into operation our products in a vessel in the Wattenmeer. And there the ships can save up to 260,000 liters of fuel per year per ship. So I think a really good impact that we can generate there or uh, also we can help uh, engines to become more efficient by tapping the hot flue gases of the engines and the jacket cooling water. But also processes such as the cement industry can be tapped and this is by, uh, by far one of the largest CO2 emit emitting industries worldwide. And uh, I think that is a great example. We will have to use concrete for the next time to do our buildings. But we have to do that more efficiently and more economic friendly. So let's let's start. Should I uh, take the screen? Let's take this one. So in doing so, I can use um the pointer yeah you have seen now a short introduction into orc and energy my co-founder uh, andreas sichert he can you see my screen now yes you can see it um he mentioned already what our vision is so we want to provide clean electricity for the global energy revolution at the lowest possible cost how do we want to achieve this? How we want to do this? We integrated our mission already in the company's name, ARCAN, an abbreviation, Organic Ranking Cycle Application Efficiency. This is what we want to do. We want to apply a specific technology, the ORC uh, technology, to make different applications more efficient. Those applications uh, can be found in mainly three segments. Industrial applications, always um, production steps or industries where a lot of energy at high temperature is used to yeah, transfer, transform or produce goods. Um, the waste heat can be harvested and recycled into electrical energy. So one example was already given, the cement industry, but also refineries, 
oil and gas uh, production, metallurgy, uh, steel production are other examples where our um, technology can be applied. In marine systems, it's clear. So the propulsion of the ship is done by a combustion engine delivering exhaust gas and jacket cooling water, which can be transformed into additional electricity. But there are also other uh, engines on the ship, so the so-called gensets, uh, to provide electricity, which can also be um, adapted and, and uh, linked to an organic Rankine cycle to increase the efficiency. In some regions, the same technology combustion en engines are used to produce land-based electricity, like is, it is the case in emerging countries. You see here an engine power plant where also uh, our organic Rankine cycle units have been uh, attached to. In power production, uh, we also look on geothermal applications where we harvest um, hot water coming from the underground. Common uh, to all those applications is that an ORC is saving cost, is reducing carbon emissions, and is increasing the efficiency of this application. The question now is uh, when this market is so big, so why uh, is or was there no technology? So the ORC itself is a proven technology but up to now, it was not available for the mass market. We did not uh, reinvent, let's say, this uh, cycle completely, but we built it in another way. So we used, as uh, it was already explained um, by Mr. Rowan, um, standardized components. We took components from the industry shelf to apply them in our ORC. So what you see here is the, yeah, functioning principle of our product. So let's start here with the liquid working fluid. It is pressurized by a pump. The high pressure liquid is going to an evaporator where the heat is fed into the system. The waste heat can be of different form. It can be gassy form like exhaust gas or vapor. It can be liquid like um, jacket cooling water or hot liquids from production, or it can be the combination of gas and liquid, like it's the case uh, for the combustion engines. This heat then is used in the evaporator to preheat and evaporate um, the working fluid and is then um, going uh, to the expander. The expander is fed by high pressure vapor um, is turned, is put into rotation where electricity is produced in the generator. The pressure loses yeah, temperature and pressure and goes as low pressure vapor to the condenser where it's liquefied and fed into the feed pump again. The main interest of the customer is electricity, but he can also be provided with hot water or hot air if he needs it for heating purposes, for example, or for drying goods or heating greenhouses, whatever. Where did we start? How did we go from Germany into um, our neighbor nations and into the world? So we started in Germany with first installations of our product in the biogas environment, where we harvested um, waste heat from biogas engines. Then we went into uh, the European surrounding, where we found also those applications. We adapted our system um, to be applicable for industrial applications. The next big step then was um, to go international. And we did this not on our own. So the step uh, to Asia uh, was done together with a joint venture company uh, or in form of a, a joint venture company where we brought in intellectual property partner companies brought in uh, money. So we formed a um, joint venture, which then produced, installed, and commissioned um, our products in Asia, namely in China and in Myanmar. Northern, um, North America, Canada um, is the most recent step. Uh, the same holds true uh, for marine applications in the big power range. Also there, we gave out or we licensed um, our technology 
to one of uh, the biggest marine uh, suppliers, Alpha Laval, which are selling our product under um, their brand um, ePowerPack. Let me give you uh, some insight how uh, this technology can look like, how it can be scaled in the market. You've already seen uh, this photo in the introductory slide. Um, the, uh, you see here a photo of uh, the world premiere, the first big uh, installation we realized in Myanmar. You see 70 combustion engines on the left and uh, on the right hand side, um, turning natural gas into electricity, but providing waste heat in form of exhaust gas and jacket cooling water. This is harvested by a waste heat exchanger and transferred as hot, um, hot water to our or C modules, which produce up to five megawatt of electricity, which is sufficient uh, to feed 120,000 people with carbon-free electricity. In the same way, we economize um, or avoid up to 17,000 tons um, of CO2. What have been the key factors to be successful in the market uh, from the university to the global player? So in founding and funding the companies, it's very important to be aware of the yeah, power of IP before funding, to do the right decisions um, at the early phase, to create the basis for uh, investing companies uh, into your venture. It must be possible that the IP is transferred from the university to the young company because it's a very important asset. And you need for sure for funding the company a vital uh, venture capital ecosystem or and or governmental funds and grant money which support your venture. The next step um, when going into the market, you need a stable entry market. You need uh, the stable market to prove the commercial feasibility so that you can show that customers pay money for your product. And um, very helpful was in our time uh, to get grant money to buffer risks which are still um, in the product when you develop it. Going into the industrialization, um, we also went into production partnerships. So we did not produce all our systems on our own. So the prototype and pre-series, yes, but the big numbers are also today uh, produced by um, production partners. You need IP as a protective instrument so that your partner cannot walk away um, with your product. I already explained that we entered um, regional markets, especially Asia with partners using IP as an asset. Regulatory aspects um, can accelerate the entry into the market like laws or regulations, um, yeah, which are favorable for your technology as it was in the first stage uh, of our company, the case in the German biogas um, market. But later on, the regulations uh, changed quickly and this hindered then the market penetration and especially this segment. And last, not least, when you look for further growth, when you have proven that you can commercialize your products, but when you wanna accelerate this, you can license it. Licensing of the technology needs IP as a basis for license agreement. This is, uh, this is uh, easy to, to understand. And uh, also distribution partnerships need a protective instrument so that partners go into um, those partnerships. So we, for example, partnered together with E.ON for industrial applications. So E.ON is um, marketing our products in um, Germany and Europe. And last not least, so um, maybe not the, the, the last, but the next step into growth would be an IPO or a trade sale. And there for sure, IP is needed to protect your market and also your margin. So to sum up, um, the key factors for a successful um, way from an invention to an innovation to a global um, use product is a strong IP portfolio are 
stable and supportive regulations, and for sure, access to funds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we now like to entertain questions. So the, maybe Dr. Kuakua has a, uh, uh, will uh, present this, uh, these questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Schuster, co-founder and CTO of Orkan Energy. I know you have just explained to us key factors for successful innovation. But I was also wondering how important were patents for Orkan when spinning out from university and starting to commercialize research results? Yeah, in, in the very beginning, um, you need IP to attract investors. So this is a, a very important step. In our case, um, IP was seen as a mandatory yeah, asset and ownership of the IP was seen as mandatory. So we have been uh, in the position to negotiate with the university to get this IP into the company, but it was like a chicken egg problem. So we needed money to buy out the IP from the university, but we needed the IP to get money from the investors. But uh, in the end, uh, we could solve this problem, incorporate, so take over the IP from the university, bring it into the company, and um, use it as, yeah, as an asset in, in, in the financing deal. And the next steps, um, the production partnership was a very important step where we went together with a, a global um, active contract manufacturer. And there it was, um, as you show, really the deepest details of your product to such a partner. IP is a, 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 a very um, important protective measure so that you keep uh, your technology in your company and make not to walk it away. Thank you very much. Just a final follow-up question. Orkan has a rich portfolio, a rich intellectual property portfolio. I believe some 170 patents as well as several trademarks. How have you adapted your intellectual property strategy as your business model has changed to that of a global player? Yeah, um, in the very uh, beginning, so the, where, when we made the first um, invention, they covered the core innovations and we protected them in a broad manner, resulting also in um, wide local coverage. The more advanced uh, the development got, the more the invention covered uh, small, smaller sub areas and details. This reflected then in a reduced local coverage. One option we see um, is to integrate ORCs into products. For example, to integrate it uh, directly into a combustion engine like a turbocharger. So the IP created for this kind of application is then registered in countries where we find uh, potential OEMs which could deploy uh, such concepts and uh, components. But most of our IP strategy stays still valid. For example, to facilitate inventors uh, to easily file a substantial invention disclosure, collaboration or uh, close collaboration uh, between our attorneys and the technical experts in the company to um, get good applications and also um, uh, good answers then on um, um, in, in the granting process. And uh, whenever possible, we want to um, have the control over our IP. So we do not like too much uh, um, joint IP. So we want to have um, yeah, the, the control on our IP on ourselves. Thank you very much, Dr. Schuster. Back to you, JPO. <laughs> 